Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming uh, to this training. My name is Steve Schulman. I'm uh, the co-chair of National Appleseed. Um, had the pleasure of, of authoring uh, this report called Getting Off the Assembly Line based on work Appleseed has done that I'll talk about um, in a moment. Um, and I'm also the pro bono partner at Aiken Gump uh, based in Washington. Um, although I should note, uh, given where we are, that I proudly started my career at Latham and Watkins in 1994 in the DC office and practiced there for 12 years. So it's great to be, great to be back here at Latham. Um, so uh, before I start, let me ask who here has has done some immigration work already? Almost everybody. And who has appeared in immigration court? So maybe about a third of the audience. So that gives me a good sense of kind of where you are and what, and what your uh, interests are. Um, so the training here, uh, what we're going to do today is give you some of the basics, but really what we wanted to focus on were some of the the obstacles in immigration court, some of the, the things that are unusual um, in our immigration court system and allow you to overcome them. And the genesis of this um, really was a lot of my own work. I, I took my first pro bono case when I was at Latham um, in 1998, so 19 years ago, almost exactly this time of year. It was, it was the spring of 1998. No one um, back then at Latham had ever been to immigration court as far as I knew. I was the only person. Um, I, I hate to date myself a little bit, but there really was no internet then, no way to actually look up immigration court rules or anything else. Um, and so uh, from that, I became somewhat of a self-taught immigration lawyer um, and have now litigated cases all the way from Boston to South Texas. Um, and, and appeared in immigration court um, all over. And my work with Appleseed, um, and those of you who are not familiar with Appleseed, Appleseed is a nonprofit network of 17 public interest justice centers, um, 16 in the United States, one in Mexico City, um, that really look at um, systemic issues and then use nonpartisan, evidence based um, approaches to identifying those problems and solutions, and then recommends uh, solutions that are practical um, and achievable. And one of the issues we decided to look at many years ago, and, and Malcolm Rich here from Chicago Appleseed really started this with his uh, work on video conferencing, was the workings of the immigration court system. Um, when we started this in two, the project in 2008, by then in the 10 years that I had been practicing immigration courts, the private kind of pro bono bar of immigration lawyers had really blossomed. I would say now um, probably 25% of Aiken's docket is it, pro bono docket is immigration work, and I don't think that's particularly unusual um, for big law firms. Um, so we do practice a lot in immigration court, and it has all these oddities. So what we um, did was study the immigration, um, the immigration system. Uh, and look at what are the things that we can really try to affect and change. Um, things like discovery or the lack thereof, pre-hearing conferences or the lack thereof, video conferencing, interpretation, and misconduct by IJs and DHS. And so we issued two reports, the first one in 2009 called Assembly Line Injustice, and then in 2012, looking back over three years at what had changed, um, it called Reimagining the Immigration Court Assembly Line, and we were able to make some progress in a lot of different areas, um, uh, getting better interpretation, better video conference systems. But at the end of the day, one of the things we felt was that we were you know, running into some roadblocks at the systemic level, things like video conferencing, where we would meet with the head of the Executive Office of Immigration Reform, which is basically the, the agency within DOJ that overlooks the immigration courts, and we'd say, we don't think video conferencing is fair. Uh, we think there should be all in-person hearings, or at least when the applicant wants to be in person, that should be mandatory. And the response we got was, that ain't going to happen. We are never going to get away from video conferencing for many reasons, and I'll discuss some of those later. And so th then we thought, OK, if we're not getting rid of video conferencing, and we put out two reports that just say, get rid of video conferencing or make it better, what we haven't done is tell practitioners, how do you make it better in your individual case? It's one thing to kind of sit back when you're you know, looking at a policy level. It's another thing when you're sitting there with a client and facing a video conference hearing, what are the ways that you try to make that as fair as possible 
or try to avoid video conferencing in the first place. Same thing with discovery. We kind of advocate a lot of different discovery avenues. We, we had a, a preliminary but not final success, unfortunately, that we got in the, in the Senate uh, comprehensive immigration reform bill. If you remember way back when, that actually looked like it was going to have bipartisan support. Um, it had 67 votes in the Senate. Um, and we got a provision that was going to be mandatory disclosure of all uh, – all of the immigration, the immigrants' documents by uh, DHS was part, of, ended up being part of that bill. Unfortunately, that hasn't come to fruition. But again, this guide now, and this is the guide that we that we um, that we issued late last year, called "Getting Off the Assembly Line," looks at that. And instead of saying how can we change it, it's how can you achieve better discovery results in your individual case. Same thing with pre-hearing conferences and other issues we'll talk about today. But one thing I want to say as a caveat for today's um, uh, presentation um, is to the extent we're talking about things like pushing back against video conferencing or demanding a certain mode of interpretation, of course, all of this has to be done in the context of the case and your responsibility to your own individual client. At no time are we advocating that you kind of take on these policy issues in an, in an individual case where it might not be appropriate um, for your client or might harm your, your client. Um, but we, what we are giving you is the tools to fight um, when necessary. So let me give you a little overview of the immigration court system. Um, Immigration court, if you think about it, is basically the due process that we give for removal or deportation from the United States. Um, almost all proceedings, although not all, but almost all proceedings at immigration court, and certainly the ones that most of us work on, are removal proceedings or deportation proceedings, where if at the end of the day, after appeal, it isn't successful, the person is supposed to be removed from the United States. The relevant agencies are the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, as a kind of now maybe historical footnote going back, these were um, – the Immigration Service was in one agency called INS. Um, you occasionally still hear people in the government talk about INS um, or even in popular culture. It doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed in 14 years. Um, you can still see it on government forums sometimes. but. Um, in the, 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 the Homeland Security Act uh, that went into effect in 2003 stripped out every part of, of INS that used to be in the Department of Justice, put it in the new Department of Homeland Security, like Border Patrol and um, uh, Citizenship and, um, and Immigration Services and all those services, put them in DHS, and left behind only one piece, which is the immigration court piece. So you have this weird thing now where you have two different agencies who are kind of responsible for immigration law. Um, and in fact, when it goes up on appeal, even though the immigration decisions come out of DOJ, the client and who is actually in, in charge of the appeal, not legally appearing in court, but is mandating as the client what happens is DHS. So it's a very weird relationship in a lot of ways and a very contentious one, uh, frankly, in Washington. And I'll discuss that in a moment. Um, in terms of the relevant law, um, the Immigration and Nationality Act, which is one of those fun acts that is not numbered the same as it is in 8 U.S.C. So it's like, you know, 101 is – or I think 101 is 1101, and but it doesn't even go quite in that order. It can be very confusing. Um, so just know that. When you're looking at the INA uh, sites for something, it's not the same as the 8 U.S.C. site. Um, 8 CFR would, would then be the regulations under it. The other resources you should always look at when you're practicing immigration court are the Immigration Court Practice Manual. Easy, you can easily find it online. That's basically the equivalent of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure or the local rules in a federal court case. Um, and then the Immigration Judge Bench Book, which is buried deep within the EOR website, um, within the Executive Office of Immigration Reform website. But you can find it just by Googling it. Um, that is essentially what the judges look at, and it is public um, for a whole host of things, both procedural um, uh, procedural rules in or practices internally um, to to uh, basically template opinions uh, that they that they give on certain issues. So it's a very valuable resource. The other one is the Asylum Officer Basic Training Course, um, which is also available online at the USCIS website. 
Um, it's not, I wouldn't cite it directly to an immigration judge. It's not binding on them in any sense, but it gives you a good idea of what the government has viewed as relevant authority. So again, it's not, I wouldn't cite it as a treatise, and I certainly wouldn't rely on it solely, and I would check what what the government is saying the state of the law is, but it's a good place to start um, in any event. So the, the immigration adjudication process starts with often apprehension, screening, and detention. Um, if it is a detained client, if non-detained, often starts at the asylum office in the cases we work on, and then if the asylum office doesn't grant asylum, goes into the immigration court. Um, it goes into immigration court, Appeals from the immigration court are all to the Board of Immigration Appeals in um, Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, that court um, uh, hears thousands of appeals a year, issues only about 35 precedent decisions a year. If it's not a precedent decision, it's rarely available. It sometimes is published by other, something called um, IN, immigration Nationality Review, now, now I'm blanking on the name, but, but occasionally non-precedent opinions are published, but they're very hard to find. So you can imagine it, it is a big body that decides lots of cases, but not a lot are precedent. Um, and then, oddly enough, the appeals are to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, not over the BIA, but that are over the immigration court that rendered the initial decision. So if you're here in Chicago, you have a Chicago immigration court decision. You appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals, um, which is, I should also mention, paper only. They have maybe five oral arguments a year. Um, I've been filing briefs in that court for almost two decades and have never even come close to an oral argument um, or even seen one, for that matter. Um, so it's all done on paper. And then uh, an appeal out of the immigration court would come to the Seventh Circuit uh, here, which is a very favorable circuit for immigration law. So this is a uh, chart, whoops, I would imagine a little bit hard to see uh, from the back, but um, basically the first step in any immigration court proceeding is called a notice to appear. Think of that as the complaint in a civil case or a charging document, an indictment in a criminal case, the same equivalent. You then go to a, what's called a master calendar hearing. I'll talk about master calendar in a moment. Master calendar is like a scheduling hearing. Um, the immigration judge can render a decision at that if there are no kind of arguments against remo removability or relief from removability. You could just be removed at master calendar. So imagine they say, you enter, you cross the border, you, you have no visa to be here, you're not a national of the United States, and you admit to all of that, and they say, what is your claim for relief? You say, I have no reason to be here. That would be the end of the case. That's not the cases we typically work on, obviously. Then it goes to individual, what they call a merits hearing. I tend to refer them as trials because that's what they are. Um, the immigration judge issues a decision. The decision can grant relief, can actually terminate proceedings, relatively rare, can order removal or deportation, and, and also offer something called voluntary departure where the, the individual says, I'm not going to contest this anymore, I'm going to leave. Um, and then we talked about appeals to the BIA. Um, the, only the alien, uh, which, which is the, the technical legal term, obviously, for, for an immigrant immigration court, um, can appeal to the federal court. Um, that's a basic principle of administrative law. When you think this is all administrative law, so when you kind of bring it back to the rubric, it's all Administrative Procedures Act, Chevron deference, that kind of thing, when you get to the, get to the uh, appellate court level. And because it's administrative procedure, the government can't appeal its own decision, right? So the government's never appealing up to the circuit court, um, even though we have this odd thing, again, where DOJ has officially rendered the decision, but DHS is the one who's litigated it up, up, and if you're litigating in the Seventh Circuit and you say to the, the AUSA who's on the other side, we don't think this was a correct decision, review it, they will go back not to DOJ to say to the immigration judge or the BIA to say why you issue this decision, but instead to DHS and see what their position is on the, on, on the decision. So kind of a very weird dynamic uh, there. Um, so some of the things in, the, in this process that, that are important for you to understand um, one is, so the merits, the, the master calendar, when you go to that master calendar hearing, that is a huge cattle call. 
Anybody who's been to the one can probably imagine it. It is a room, you know, an immigration court about the size of this room, about as filled as this room is, and people just get called up to the bench one after the other. It's not private at all. And it's essentially several things are being done. Pleadings are being taken, which means, as I said before, are you removable for the United States? Do you have relief from removal? Um, those are usually the two primary questions. And then the last one is, when are we scheduling your next hearing? Which may be a further master if something else needs to happen or the individual merits the trial. So that's what's happening there. Um, and then you have the uh, merits hearing or the trial uh, scheduled after that. So what happens in between? Nothing. That's what, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that is one of the beauties and the frustrations of litigating immigration court is that unlike state court litigation or federal court litigation, nothing happens in between. You are out on your own developing your case, and DHS doesn't have a care in the world about what's going on, which is part of the frustration uh, and part of what we're trying uh, to get at. Um, so let's talk about immigration court discovery then. So what happens in, so as you know, in state court or federal court, you know, the most contentious part of a case often is discovery and kind of going back and forth. So one of the great things about litigating immigration court is there's no request for production, there's no interrogatories, there's no request for admission, there's no meet and confer conferences, there are no motions to compel. So if you love all that stuff about litigation, you won't like immigration court litigation. So no motions to compel, I'm really sorry. But, um, but what there is is FOIA and frustration. Um, so the bottom line is there's no discovery. You can ask, there are depositions technically allowed and in my 20 years of practicing, I've had one colleague within my firm do a, de do a deposition in immigration court. It, it happened, it was a woman that was a witness who was eight months pregnant and wasn't going to be available for the, he for the hearing, and we got it ordered. But it's highly unusual and is unlikely to happen in any case you're going to work on. So there's no discovery. So you, you need to, though, figure out how to get documents in, a, in an environment where there's no discovery. So discovery is done through the Freedom of Information Act, typically, and we'll talk about how to do that in a moment. But the questions to ask yourself is, what is the government likely to have? Because the, 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 the only way you're really getting documents, besides just you know sh sh uh, shoe leather discovery, going out and getting witnesses and other things, but if you're getting documents kind of from the other side, the government, you want to figure out what they have. So one thing is, if your client was detained at the border, if your client was detained at the border, they are going to have been interviewed at the border uh, by Border Patrol. They likely will have been detained a little bit, so there's going to be some file of detention. If they are in the, are they, if they are applying for asylum, they pass something called a credible fear interview. So they're going to have all of that, and that's going to be typically what we call their A file or alien file. Um, and so you you will want to FOIA that. Um, has your client made any immigration filings without you? This happened recently in a case. A Syrian came to me who had filed for asylum and hadn't heard anything from the asylum. This was an asylum office matter, but hadn't heard anything for five years. I couldn't possibly represent him without, and he didn't have his documents, His couldn't locate his prior lawyer, so we filed a FOIA to get his documents. Um, the one thing I should note is you can copy the court file. So to the extent that there is already a court file, you can go down to the court. There are hours they allow you to copy it. Some courts have different rules about how many copies you can make. But you should be able to get, get that without FOIA, just going down and doing it. But the first thing you should always think about when you meet with a client that's in immigration court is, what am I going to FOIA? And so then the, the second question becomes not just what does the government have, but what, what do you need to prove your, your, your client's case? Prior statements, obviously, you're going to want to have, and DHS is likely to have those and use them for impeachment. Um, any documents that were seized from your client, identity documents, other documents when they came across the border, DHS often takes those documents from them, doesn't, isn't always good about giving them back or doesn't give them back because it's a passport and they're not letting them leave, um, so you want to get at least copies of those documents back. 
And then if they've been in detention and they're, med- they're relevant medical records, there aren't always, but if there are, things like, for example, therapist notes, other things, if they were in detention for a long period, you may want to try to get those uh, as well. So your client's documents, even if they bring you a pile of documents like this, they are unlikely to be complete. So don't rest on saying, my client gave me their documents, I'm fine. FOIA should be the first thing uh, you absolutely uh, go to for this. So this is the FOIA form. It's uh, just a typical form called the G639. Um, Again, I would use this at the first meeting uh, with a client, and then you uh, describe the the records requested. I would send it to ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, which is in charge of detention and also in charge of the trial. So they are the the Office of Chief Counsel. I would send it to USCIS. If they have ever applied for any immigration benefit, you want to send it to USCIS, and to Customs and Border Patrol, which may have documents about their entry to the United States. So I would send out three three different FOIA requests. They may end up overlapping because the agencies share files, but I wouldn't um, I wouldn't uh, uh, rest on just saying that one um, agency is going to have it. The um, the other thing I would say is uh, when you get the documents back from FOIA, as you as anybody who's dealt with FOIA knows that there are exceptions to the Freedom of Information Act. And there are often redactions that come with these documents. I just did a, that same FOIA I was talking about with the client, the Syrian client I represented. I got back his all, – all that was in there mainly, except for a few pages, were his filing that he had filed to the asylum office. And I got like four copies of it back. Each copy was redacted differently. Again, these are documents he submitted to the government, by the way, and then they sent it back to us redacted. Um, so, um, so one of the things, obviously it's annoying. I got more of a laugh out of it. And at the end of the day, I could have litigated a FOIA case about it. It wasn't necessary. So think about, do you need what's behind those, those exceptions or can you just go ahead? But expect that there will be redactions that will make you uh, probably scratch your head. Um, so some of the other documents you're likely to see, things like um, for an asylum seeker, whoops, Okay, hold on, sorry. Okay. There we go. For an asylum seeker, you're, re- you're likely to see this credible fear uh, worksheet. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into great detail about how to litigate around this, but you're often uh, going to see this as a primary background document for an asylum seeker who's been detained because they would have had to pass this credible fear interview in order to get into the immigration court system. Uh, These documents actually say on them that they are not verbatim transcripts, but often DHS will treat it like a verbatim transcript, so just be aware of that, that it is, uh, you know, and often it's translated, so your client's testimony to this, and presumably an unrepresented client at the time in detention, talking to an asylum officer, translated, and then it says it's not even a a transcript, DHS will still try to impeach your client um, with something that's of, of, I would say, dubious value. Uh, You know, saying, for example, your client didn't say X, um, didn't say that she was a victim of domestic violence, she just said she feared gangs. Uh, when she came into the United States. So be aware of that. That's, uh, that, that's often what you'll get. There's also interviews at the border on something called an I-213, uh, and those are the documents you should be looking at, looking at. In our guide, we go through a whole list of different documents you're likely to see uh, in an immigration file. Um, okay, so next is um, immigration court pretrial. So immigration court pretrials, we talked about, one of the great things about immigration court is you go to master calendar and you never have to see the DHS attorney again until trial. Don't deal with them at all, right? None of that annoying opposing counsel, back and forth, no meet and confer. Um, But that's also a problem um, because basically you are not talking to DHS at all about your case. In fact, the DHS attorney who shows up at the master calendar, this big cattle call, is likely to have nothing to do with your case going forward. So you can't even 
kind of cozy up to the DHS attorney like you might in a case, you know, in a, even in a criminal case and say, hey, you know, can we work this out? You know, this really isn't a case you want to litigate. They don't care. It's not their case. They're never going to see it. They may likely never see it again. So that doesn't work. Um, but let's say you file, and, and the filings are typically 15 days ahead of time, or as you get close to the hearing, you're thinking, my God, like this is an obvious case. This is a Syrian pro-democracy activist. Why do we have half a day for immigration court hearing on this case? Isn't this going to be kind of a case that we just should be doing? Um, so let's say you call up the DHS lawyer. Why don't you come up here? I'm going to have you play the DHS lawyer. So I call up and I say, hi, this is Steve Shulman. I'm representing Red One Ziada. He's a human rights activist. We just did our filing last week. Um, our hearing's in 10 days before Judge Frimmer Frammer. And um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the case. I know it's, it's on your docket. Um, so what's your position on Red Lawn's case? He's, he's a good, he's really, I mean, he's in the media. You've probably seen him in the media. He's out there all the time. What do you think? I have no idea. Okay, exactly. That's exactly what a DHS attorney would say. So any of you could have played the role of the DHS attorney. Um, <laughs> because it's often that the DHS attorney will not have read the file till a day or two before the hearing. Um, so you're going to call up and get that. So what do we do then? I mean, that is like one of my eternal frustrations. And this has happened to me on times. I, I had a team. We went all the way down to Harlingen, Texas for a hearing. And this was, we had some summer associates involved, so we had more people than we needed. But I think we had like four or five people go down to Harlingen, Texas to do this case. And we get down there, and it was, I'm trying to remember the judge's name, the great judge, really sweet guy, comes down. He was really interested that we had summer associates there. And we had been calling the DHS attorney. It was a very obvious case, a, a woman from Burma who had been raped, and it was you know, terrible facts, but good facts to win on. And uh, we get down there, DHS attorney walks in, but the judge is kind of orchestrating everything. Who's going to do the opening? Who's going to do this? I mean, 15 minutes were going on about the judge trying to set it all up and talking to the, the students and saying, it's so great you guys are doing this. And like, you know, which one of you wants to actually talk and do the closing? I know you're not lawyers yet, but that's okay. He's like kind of going on and on. And then finally, we get it all set settled. I'm sitting kind of in the back supervising. And the DHS attorney stands up and says, uh, we're going to stipulate to this case. That was it. Um, then the case was over. So we had all flown down to Harlingen, Texas. Now, I mean, it was great for the client. I mean, you, you know, you're not going to complain about that exactly. But, you know, it would have been nice a week ahead of time to say, I reviewed the file. I don't think your client needs to testify. You all don't need to come down here. Um, that happens more and more often uh, than you think and is kind of very frustrating. So how do we get... How do we get beyond that? And so a couple of the strategies um, we have, um, and this is just showing you what happens when you call it DHS. Um, that's essentially what you get. Um, is, you know, and it's particularly important now with the immigration court delays. You may know um, the court delays, especially here in Chicago, are particularly acute. I have one case here in the Chicago court that the master calendar it was referred for, from the asylum office in 2015, 16, 2006, no, 15, 2015, and uh, has not been uh, scheduled for a master calendar, that first hearing, the cattle call, until 2019, which means that the merits hearing is who knows when, right? And it's a poor Palestinian guy, Palestinian, stateless Palestinian who we should be able to resolve this case. Like if you could sit down with somebody, there's no, literally nobody to sit down with. So what do we do? Now, before a master calendar, I can't even get anybody's attention, unfortunately. But once we hit master, what are we going to do with this case? Well, first, when we go to the master calendar, we're going to say to the immigration judge, we want a pre-hearing conference in 60 days or 90 days. We want DHS to come back and tell the court how much time it needs for the hearing, why it's going to pose this relief in this case, and we want to resolve this early. Now, is that going to work every time? No, not necessarily. Again, these are strategies, not necessarily kind of rules in the immigration court. But that's one thing you can do is be very aggressive in the beginning with your case, especially if you've been waiting on it for a while and are prepared and say, we are prepared to go. Now, sometimes the courts will slot you in early if you're prepared to go, if there's a cancellation. 
obviously, if you're pro bono counsel or even paid counsel, that can be very difficult if they're saying, we don't know when you're going go to go to hearing, but we're going to give you a week's notice and hopefully you'll slot in. Um, that can be a very difficult ask. Um, but even so, one thing you can say is we want to come back here and have a discussion, have the parties really understand why we're spending time on this case. You could flip that around and also ask for, and the rules do allow for, and some judges are fond of, although not nearly enough, asking for a pre-hearing conference before the trial, 30 days out, 45 days out, before your filings are due, um, like you would have in federal court litigation. So again, these are unfortunately not that common in immigration court, although the the rules do uh, provide for them. And in that, again, you would sit down with DHS and say, what can we stipulate to? And there are many issues in a typical immigration case that you should be able to stipulate to, including things, for example, where you might be calling in an expert to say, we have an expert witness who's going to testify about, you know, the... uh, the domination of ISIS around different areas of Syria, which frankly isn't something you really probably need an expert for, but you might have an expert for that if you've got somebody whose village is on the border or, you know, somewhere there. And, you know, it's expensive, or even if you're getting a pro bono expert, it's a lot of time to bring in. And so one issue you might say is, can we take that off the table? Can we all agree that ISIS is dominating this town? And so there are lots of issues, if not ultimately relief, you should be able um, to agree to. Um, so that's another way of, of trying to get um, early resolution and trying to use the rules um, to your advantage in immigration court. Then there are strategies for DHS. As I said, you know, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, you know, they, they never answer the phone, and it is hard. They, you can call and call and call, and that's what I encourage you to do is call nearly every day, Um, You can, one strategy we have tried to use is to proffer witnesses. So say to DHS, will you stipulate if we bring in our client or bring in this witness to meet with you ahead of time? Now, I just recently had a New York uh, immigration court um, DHS attorney say, we don't do it that way, we won't do it that way, you have to wait till November for your hearing. Um, And so, you know, it doesn't always work that way, but that's another strategy you can employ. Um, I have had that work in kind of informal, in-between immigration court hearings. Um, I have had that work in Arlington. Um, You can set out kind of your strategy or your positions in a cover letter with your pretrial submission. So your pretrial submission is due 15 days ahead of time in immigration court unless it's set otherwise by the judge. And what I often do in a cover letter to the, and this is in, a sample of this is in the guide, in a cover letter to DHS to say, we plan to provide the following witnesses. We don't believe that the following witness is necessary. We've put in a declaration, and if you disagree, let us know. Um, Now, there's some risk to that because DHS might say, we never read the letter, but um, that seems to me to be more their risk than your risk if you, you know, put it very clearly in a letter that you sent. And it is, you know, not obviously your client who's not coming. Your client has to come, so you can't put that in the letter. But you could put, my expert is not, my expert submitted an affidavit. He can be available by phone if you want, but we're not planning to bring the expert to the hearing because we don't believe this is a, this should be a contested issue. Um, and try to put the onus um, on DHS. Here in Chicago, and we talk about this in the in the guide, there was a very interesting pilot project called AMPT. Did anybody ever work through that project? You might know that AMPT, A-M-P-E-D. Uh, and I can't remember what the acronym stood stood for, but it was a, a cute acronym. But basically, it was early mediation and and prosecutorial discretion um, of cases. And they had a form, this AMPT form that you could fill out and actually get. Uh, uh, get essentially quick resolution with DHS of your case. Unfortunately, they've um, they've terminated that program. But it's worth looking back at that and at least modeling your negotiations with DHS around what that AMP program was. Again, while they've terminated the pilot program, it doesn't mean that the practical realities of what they were asking for um, can still be used uh, here in Chicago. So this is one of my favorite comics. I don't know if you can all read it here, but but it's a it, this is interpretation. Um, so uh, the um, the witness is saying, at the time of the murder, I was at home watching Kill Bill. 
And the interpreter says, mm, it was murder time, so I left home and killed Bill, um, which are very different, very different things. It, interpretation in immigration court may be the biggest single challenge you will face as a lawyer representing somebody and that your client likewise will face. Um, there's a great story that, that we got in the guide, and part of what we did in this guide was go out to practitioners and ask them for kind of tips and stories. Um, and there's a story where a, I believe it's a Somali man, was testifying, and the interpretation was my um, left finger was shot off. And he's talking to the immigration judge, and he has all ten of his fingers. And he kind of understood English, and, and, and the, he kept saying no to the interpreter, and the interpreter would interpret again, say, my left finger was shot And he finally was like this, like, I've got five fingers. And... And and the and he said and then he the Somali guy yells out my finger toe my finger toe and apparently in Somali your long f- toe that's next to your big toe is called your finger toe because it looks a little bit more like a finger right so it's just a good example of interpretation not coming through and needing to be very clear about um, about what's being interpreted so a few a few um, tips for it so what is interpretation like in immigration court. Well, first, there's there are two different there are four different concepts or two different concepts with with kind of opposite modes. So the first to understand, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into detail on this, but is simultaneous versus consecutive translation. So simultaneous is what you think of like at the UN, right? You got headphones on and somebody's going back and forth. It takes a tremendous amount of skill for a translator to do that. Some immigration courts do use do use uh, simultaneous translation. Some immigration courts use consecutive translation. If there's a reason why it's better for your client to use one or the other, that's fine. Um, The one thing I will say is that as a lawyer who doesn't uh, who doesn't speak the language, I think even if you did speak the language of of, of your client, um, consecutive translation, while it takes a lot longer, because obviously it's the person saying it, then the translator listening and saying it back and saying it in English, um, it gives you time to monitor what's going on. It, does, it makes the hearing twice as long, but it does give you time to monitor the translation and kind of understand what's going on uh, in the translation. The more important issue is full versus partial translation or interpretation. Um, and this is something that, that frankly galls me that we even have to still talk about this in immigration court. Um, it is in 2013 there was an order that said every, trans, every immigration court should be fully translated. Um, but what partial translation is, and immigration courts continue to do this, is they will translate only when the speaker is not speaking English into the into the language, so obvious. But most of the time, what you're talking about is your client sitting in the conference, sitting in the trial, only having translated what your client is saying or what is being asked to your client. So imagine that being sitting sitting in a hearing where all you know is what you're saying, what you are saying back and forth, and what's being said to you directly. But everything your lawyer is saying is in a language you don't understand. Is in that Charlie Brown, wah, 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 right? That's all you hear. I will give you an example of this. I was at a hearing in Boston in um, several years ago, and it was a, just a wonderful man, Christopher Pasquala uh, from Albania. His case had been up and back, and finally we were at trial. And... Uh, he had lived here for a number of years, but had never really mastered English at all. Didn't really understand it very well. And the hearing we had that day it was a, a very tense hearing because, again, it had been appealed and had come back, and it was a lot about authenticating documents from Albania. And we had experts who were authenticating those documents and talking about the threats that Chris had done. And we had a very, very, very aggressive DHS attorney. Um, and so all the, and, and I asked the, the immigration judge, can we have this translated? And the immigration judge has said, no, we only do partial translation at this hearing. And in fact, Chris never testified that day. The hearing got continued um, that day for 14 months. 
continuance because we couldn't complete the hearing. So all Chris heard all that day was yelling, basically. I mean, it was a, it was a very aggressive, tense hearing. And you can imagine this poor man sitting here, and it's his life on the line, right? And all that's being translated, and he, nothing is being translated. In fact, we, we asked if his family members who did speak English could translate in the gallery, and the judge said, no, I, I don't want to hear them talking. It's interrupting the court. Um, so that is a serious due process issue when your client cannot hear what is being said. Um, even if, I mean, and, and in addition, your client has every right to hear um, what's being said when they are going to testify. So the witness before them, witness after them, imagine, you know, kind of going into a hearing. It essentially is excluding them from the hearing. And it is. It's not essentially. It is excluding them from the hearing as if they were being kind of sequestered from their own trial. Um, so it's something that, that I think uh, we need to be, as lawyers, very vigilant about because it really does get to the root of, of due process for our clients. Um, then you've got just the routine issue. So let's assume that, you're able, that you get full translation, and one of, the, one of the ways to ensure full translation, go witness an immigration court hearing by the judge, make sure that the judge is doing full translation. If they're not, I would file a motion to asking for full translation and explaining why you want full translation. It's amazing, I have to say, you have to explain why you want full translation, but explain why you want full translation. Um, there are other common problems, though. Even when you have full translation, uh, make sure that the dialect is the same. So one thing, anytime you're having the having your client be translated, make sure that your client is understanding. The good immigration judges, and often they will, they will do that for you, make sure that the translation is working well. Um, another routine problem with translators um, who aren't as experienced, um, and this also is good tips for working with translators as you're preparing for a hearing, are translators who try to kind of wait for too many words. So one of the things to do is to also train your client as they're testifying to testify in chunks so that they are saying two sentences and then stopping on their own as opposed to making the translator tell them to stop. Um, it's a hard thing to do. It takes some work, but it's important that you get the, the translation across. Then there's you know, routine communication. Miscommunications can be problems, as can bias on occasion um, of translators. So you want to make sure that, um, that if you have any issue, any reason to think that a translator might be from a different tribe or some other way and your client should be able to clue you in as to whether there are any sensi cultural sensitivities, uh, you should be aware of that and uh, perhaps uh, even doing a voir dire of the translator, um, asking questions before the hearing from the judge. Um, one of the other questions that often comes up is whether your client needs an interpreter. Um, and many clients are tempted to translate or tempted to speak in English, especially if they've been here for a while, um, to show that they're part of the country. And, and I think as lawyers, we're tempted to have our clients speak in English because it's easier. They can, they're making eye contact with the judge, right? They're not looking at a translator. Um, but I will say that this, there's a lot of good kind of social science research that says unless your client speaks English regularly in their home, they should not be testifying in English. That, that the thought process of translating in their own head is going to limit what they are able to convey, even if you can't quite sense that, that you're basically making them undertake two co cognitive tasks at once um, that are going to essentially be cognitive overload for them potentially and going to compromise their testimony. So one great tip that we got, one sec, one great tip we got from somebody, if, if you do have a client who really wants to speak in English um, but you think it's a, it's a bad idea, is to have the, the client introduce him or herself to the judge in English and say, I do speak English. I don't speak it, you know, it's not my native language. I feel more comfortable in this important proceeding testifying in my native language, but I want you to know that I, I, do under, I do speak English. It's also good to let the judge know the level of your client's English cognition, even if you're using a translator, because often, you know, obviously if you're using a translator, the client will understand a lot of the questions going 
ahead and you don't want the judge thinking that your client somehow didn't disclose that they understood more than than they think they understand. Do you have a question? I just newly question. Yeah. Are these court appointed oh. interpreters? Do you have any Thank you for asking. I had that in my notes and I forgot to say. So uh, two very good questions. For those of you who didn't uh, maybe hear it, it's are these court-appointed translators? And the answer to that is yes. These are court translators. You have no choice. You don't even know who they are till you show up that day. So there's no way to work with the translator. It's just there's a roster of translators. Yeah, you could give them a list of terms ahead of time, right, like you would do for a deposition, for example, to the court reporter. Um, absolutely, give them a list of terms and, and – uh, or we'll work, yeah, uh, obviously ahead of time uh, rather than a court reporter we'd sometimes do after. Um, the next question is can you bring your own translator? And sometimes we do that is if we think it's a particularly complicated language or we think there might be an issue, we will have somebody who speaks the language sitting behind, not behind counsel table, but right behind. I'll show you a picture in immigration court in a second behind the, the bar who will kind of monitor and make sure things are going well. You can object to translate to interpretation in immigration court, and we have done that on a number of occasions. Now, obviously, you have to know that something's going wrong to be able to, to object, and sometimes that's what happens. We have somebody in the, in the gallery, or sometimes you're lucky enough to have co-counsel if you don't speak the language, um, and we have had counsel who speaks the language and is able to object. The way to object, um, and, and I apologize, this may be kind of obvious, but do not interrupt the translation unless it's somehow going to be so prejudicial that you can't possibly allow the translator to finish. Allow the translator to finish. Objection, Your Honor. I think there was a mistranslation. And then the proper course is to, is to ask the question again, have the translator translate again, and have the answer given again. Um, to make sure the record is clear. Uh, but it's a very important part of immigration court um, and it, uh, immigration court practice, and it often can make the difference between uh, success and failure and your client's credibility um, if translation is not, is not adequate. Um, and we have had circumstances where we have had to terminate proceedings and basically ask for another translator um, because of poor translation. It's very it, that's relatively rare, but um, but it's something you definitely want to be uh, want to be monitoring. So the next issue is immigration court video conferencing. And again, as I mentioned, this was one of the issues. Malcolm going back into the into the um, mid two thousands. Uh, was really looking at um, the fairness of video conferencing as it started to grow um, around the country. And we, we really have both in Washington and locally taken on video conferencing and tried to argue to the immigration courts, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully, uh, against its widespread implementation. Um, but again, what we decided in issuing the guide was we knew that Eeyore had said over and over again, we're not getting rid of all video conferencing. We're not giving people necessarily even the right to object to video conferencing. So how do we make, how do we make video conferencing better? And I, I will mention one, one interesting study that came out by UCLA law professor Ingrid Eagley um, noted that, that at least in her study of, of the data, that immigration judges were not really affected by um, uh, by, by video conference testimony, but it was the clients who were affected by the video conference testimony, the clients who felt separated from the court and felt like they weren't um, fully participating in the court, and often clients gave up claims for relief because they felt like they just weren't engaged in the court process. Um, so this is what an immigration court looks like. Um, I would say the amazing thing is almost every immigration court looks like this. I've been in lots of immigration courts some of them have windows. That would be the difference. Almost all they, whoever makes this makes a ton of money by making immigration courts because they're all identical. They make them en masse. But, um, but some of them are a tiny bit bigger. But for the most part, that is the standard suite for immigration court. And when I was talking about that, council tables up there, and you might have you know, other people sitting right behind you uh, to assist. But you can see the video conferencing equipment right there, that flat screen uh, on your right. Is the uh, uh, is where the client would come in uh, by video conferencing, and this is a picture a little bit blurry. This is actually the same court in Boston where Chris Pasquala 
had his hearing that I talked about that wasn't interpreted. This is what the video conferencing looked like. I snuck behind the judge's bench when he was out and took a picture of it. Um, so that gives you a sense of what the judge is looking at when the judge is doing a video conference hearing. The important thing, though, is to think about what your client is looking at. And what your client is looking at is usually just the judge. Sometimes the judge the judge is not looking at the client the whole time, unfortunately, often looking down at papers, you know, hopefully just reading papers about your case and not reading something else, looking at the computer screen. So you really have to teach your client how to testify by video if you're going to end up with video conference hearing. Um, so let me talk about that kind of first with best practices in working with video conferencing. Um, first is, um, well, let me go through this, the order I put it in. So why video? Why do they do video conference hearings? One is the detained docket. Um, more and more uh, immigrants are detained um, in our system. Does anybody know what the daily census is of detained immigrants? You want to have a guess? Pretty close. It's about 40,000 now. But yeah, it probably be 50,000 pretty soon. Um, and, uh, uh, and we detain upwards of 400,000 uh, individual separate immigrants every year. But the daily census is about 40,000. It, it has been increasingly relied upon. Uh, and then in not every but most detention centers do not have immigration judges. Instead, even if they're not that far from the immigration, uh, from the detention center, they tend to be in courts. Like in San Antonio, it was an hour away from the Carnes Detention Center in, uh, that was detained women and children from Central America. And the judges would sit in there, even though there was a, you know, a courthouse there, a room that kind of looked like that room I showed you, they would sit in San Antonio and have the hearings by video, and the person would just be brought to sit at a table um, in front of the video. Um, there also is the headquarters immigration court, uh, which is in Arlington, Virginia, and they do hearings by video to fill in for other courts. So those aren't always detained cases. Sometimes they are, but sometimes the headquarters immigration court is actually filling in on kind of another docket. Um, so this is, and I, I wanted to mention that not only because kind of there are cases that are kind of, odd, these are, I would consider, somewhat oddball cases because you aren't expecting somebody from Arlington to be hearing the case. They're filling in for another judge, um, but also because it, it may play into strategy, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, there also is some courts will do master by video, but merits in person. A master calendar by video doesn't present likely the same due process problems, but it can. I was at a hearing, and, and we discussed this in the guide. I was at a hearing in Arlington, Virginia about a year ago. Um, it was a master calendar hearing. It was a detained individual from Honduras. And his lawyer, his lawyer pretty obviously hadn't been working with him for long. It was a master calendar, so it was a first hearing. So not, but I just got that sense from the client. And the, the, um, uh, and in fact, I, I guess the, the lawyer said to the, to the client by, or to the judge, we'd like a continuance for about 30 days. I need to go meet with the client. I need to get some more documents before we decide how we're going to plead to this case or you know, wh whether we're going to file an asylum application. And the judge said, OK, we'll give you a continuance. And, um, and the guy in a, dressed in a, in a jumpsuit um, on video, the, the Honduran man, as the judge is starting to write out the continuance order, says, Your Honor, can I say something? And the judge says, yes. He says, um, I don't want to be in detention anymore. I, don't, I, want to, I want to leave. He said, well, what do you mean you want to leave? Um, he said, well, I don't, I don't want to go anymore. I want to be deported. I, don't, I can't stay in detention. You know, he's obviously struggling being in detention. And the lawyer just sat there. Um, and the judge basically... The judge did what the judge was supposed to do. The judge was not irresponsible um, and said, do you understand if I order this, this is a final order, you're going to be removed from the United States, kind of went through everything. And the lawyer just sat there and let this all happen in a way that, again, I, I hate to use the M word, malpractice, but, um, but I don't think that would have happened if the guy was sitting next to him. 
I don't think that ever would have happened that a lawyer would sit there and let his client be deported without yanking him out in the hallway and saying, hold on, Your Honor, like, let me go talk to this guy and talk him off the ledge here, right? I just don't think that if he was in the same room as his client that he ever would have let this happen. And so think about the effect that it can have on you as a lawyer as well. Again, I don't think any of you are going to sit there and let your client be deported um, in that kind of circumstance, and hopefully you would all stand up and say, Your Honor, we're not going ahead with this. I'm going down to the detention center visiting this afternoon. We can have a hearing tomorrow. But, um, but remember that it will have an impact on you and the way you're dealing with your client. Yeah? In a video conference hearing, do you as an attorney have to be in the courtroom, or can you be with your client at the detention center that keeps me right there? That's a great question, and one you kind of like just teed up where I was going next. It's perfect. Um, it is, uh, uh, I will say, yes and yes. Um, you, you could decide, so there's, there's a couple ways to think about it here. One is you could decide, I want to be in the detention center, and you could do that. The problem is then you're not in the court, right? And you can't, you're kind of limited is what you can do. You can't hand documents up, right? You can't. It's, it, you've got to like really think it through. It is possible to do it. Um, what we have done in the past is, and again, it takes kind of a big firm and, and you know, resources to do it, is to put a lawyer in the court and put another lawyer or paralegal with the client um, and actually have two people working on a case. That can be difficult. We had a hearing in Texas, in San Antonio, where that happened, and the... Um, Basically, our lawyer there was not allowed, told by the judge he couldn't talk to the client because it was interrupting the video conference communications. Like it was too loud for the video conferencing when she would kind of whisper or whatever. So, you know, judges can be crotchety about that, but I would, I think the best practice, if you can do it, is to have somebody at each end to make sure that your client kind of understands. Um, uh, what's going on, and then uh, you know can have somebody there to. I hate to use the word coach because that's used in kind of a, a negative connotation, but to guide them through it, and especially if the, when the video starts to say, "Here's what you're seeing," because at the end of the day, what your client is seeing. If you go back to this, what your client is seeing. So just try to, if you can, if you have good good sense of space, flip that around, and what the client is seeing. Right, it's just that desk. And the client, when they are hearing questions, often now some judges, this little, this is the camera up here on this, the camera, some judges will pivot the camera. So if you're asking the questions, they'll pivot the camera to you, but they won't always do that. And so often the DHS uh, attorney's questions, for example, will just be like they're coming out of the air, right? They'll have no sense of who the DHS attorney is. They'll just hear these questions coming out. Um, and that obviously can be compromising as well. So one of the things to think about is um, whether you object to video conferencing in the first place um, and have the uh, basically do a motion for in-person hearing. Um, some judges will grant those motions. Some will grant them, but basically defer to DHS because it's DHS's responsibility to bring that person to the, the hearing. And as I mentioned, DHS and, and DOJ, uh, EOR, within DOJ, have a very strained relationship, and there isn't any real way for DOJ to, for the immigration judge to effectively enforce an order like that, except to say I'm terminating here proceedings, but even that I mean, they could say, I guess I'm going to grant relief, but that would take a really aggressive judge to do it. Um, but I think it's, at the first instance, if you believe that your client will be compromised by a video conference hearing, I would move for, for uh, an in-person hearing. But also knowing what the impact is, because part of it could be, fine, we'll do an in-person hearing. My next opening is a year from now, so your client can stay in detention for another year. Um, it could be we have a case right now that's headquarters immigration court. So this is one where the client is in Batavia, New York, detained up there. The case is being heard in Arlington. And the, if we know that if we object to the video conferencing and the case is, is heard, he's not being brought down to Arlington. He's going to be heard in Batavia. 
and the judges in Batavia have some of the lowest asylum grant rates in the country. So then we look at that and think, okay, you know, we could do that, but now we're worried that if we do that, we're going to get a really bad judge. So you've got to think about all the strategic issues around moving um, for video conferencing. So as I talked about, one of the strategies is you have a presence in the court and with your client. Um, prepare for the video again. Make sure you have documents in both places. So if you're doing a video hearing, you want to have a full set of your documents there in case your client needs to look at anything. You need to have it there. Some courts have fax machines that will go back and forth between those two places, but don't rely on that at all. Also know that your client, um, sitting in that room with your client off screen, may be a guard. Um, that remember, this is a detention center, so your client may not be alone in that room, um, which is another reason to have another person there with them who's not basically an intimidating uh, presence. There's also problems, as you might imagine, with attorney-client communication, which is, I think, somewhat that story I told you about that lawyer there, where normally you would yank somebody out and say, hey, I'm going to the I'm going to take him out in the hallway. What do you do when you're on video conference? Well, this has happened to me on a couple of occasions. The first time I actually ever had video conference back in the late 90s, I had no idea there was such a thing as video conference. Again, this is late 90s. It's like before internet. Like, who knew that, there, that we'd have even smartphones back then, right? So, so I get to the hearing, and I had just been retained. I had just volunteered to take this case from back then called Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. It's now called Human Rights First. And I walk into the court. I'm like, I knew he was detained, the client, but I figured I'd see him there. And literally had been detained the day, had been, I had been retained the day before. And so I hadn't get, gotten to meet him. So I figured I'd meet him, and I'd talk to him about the case. It was, it was an asylum case, so the initial pleadings were going to be pretty straightforward. It would probably take me five minutes to talk to him about it. Um, and so I get there, I'm like, where's my client? <laughs> I'm looking around, and then I see him, like this video monitor turn on. I'm like, and the judge says, okay, so you're representing this fellow. I said, yes. He said, are you ready to plead? I said, Your Honor, I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet. He said, well, would you like to talk to him? I said, well, yeah, I would, but all these people are in here. And he, I said, can you leave us alone? We just, and the, and the judge looked at me and he said, yeah, I guess so. So everybody left the courtroom, and I got to talk to my client. wasn't maybe the most efficient way to deal with it, but I talked to my client by video. Literally, is in these kind of initial things, it's not surprising it took about five minutes just to say, you have no claim to citizenship in the United States. You're from, I think he was from somewhere in West Africa now. I know it's so, so long ago. Um, but, uh, you know, we went through these four different charges and were able to do it. But that may be kind of your solution, too, is if you're in a room and the only way you can talk to your client is to tell the judge to everybody needs to get out and you got to just stand up for that. Yeah. So the rules about that, I mean, what would prevent you from having an associate cell phone and an interpreter in the room with your client? Your phone. client's never going to have a cell phone in the... No, your associate Oh, in the no, your associate's not going to have a cell phone in the detention center either. They're never going to let them in with it. You have an associate there and an interpreter Yeah, you could have that. I mean, you could, but but you know, in terms of getting, I guess you could shut off the video. You still would have to shut off the video, right, in order for them to have a privileged conversation, right? Or I guess they could whisper. Yeah. Right. If you had that, that's another possible solution. They could turn off the, they could mute it. Yeah, you could. I mean, again, those are kind of more logistical issues than uh, than practical issues. But yes, if you had, but typically, um, typically, what you're going to do is you now in a in a trial, there's nobody else in the room. By the way, at an immigration court trial, those are typically closed, so that's easier to vacate. You just tell DHS to get out the clerk to get out and the judge to get out and the rest you can talk. So That's exactly. pretty easy. Oh, yeah. Sounds like this is a lot more open. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have a lot more rights and things you can do to represent your client. Right, if they'll recognize the rights. Right. Yeah, a lot of it is, yeah. yeah, a lot of it is argument. Um, and then the final thing that we uh, report on in the guide and that we've reported on over time is immigration court uh, misconduct. Um, and I don't want to overstate it. I, I think in the two decades I've been practicing, the immigration courts have gotten a lot better at um, 
at disciplining uh, themselves. Their their immigration the immigration judges uh, are more professional uh, than they used to be. But still, even a couple years ago, we had an issue in San Antonio where we had uh, the women and children uh, who were detained in this Carnes Detention Center from Central America. We had a judge who was extraordinarily hostile with setting bond for these women at at least $8,500, where most judges were saying it at $2,500. And uh, we had a couple of times when the judge one time, uh, a woman was speaking with a very heavy accent, and the judge mocked her, said, wah, 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 like, did something like that at the hearing. And, um, and so we documented all this, filed it, uh, approached the assistant chief immigration judge. So EOR is organized in Washington with assistant chief immigration judges for professionalism, approached them, and, and actually got him taken off the docket. Um, but we were able to do that in part because we were um, we had a pro bono project going on there. We were working with some national NGOs. It can be very difficult if you are practicing before this immigration court every day. Do you want to, you know, as, as the saying goes, if you're going to shoot the king, you better kill the king. Um, so, uh, so, so those are things to think about, and we talk about that in the guide. There certainly can be consequences to complaining. So, one of the one of the best ways to do it is to really loop in some of the national NGOs like Human Rights First, um, who don't ordinarily practice before the immigration courts directly, or AILA, and, and have them try to take on uh, some of those. Um, one of the other um, problems with uh, immigration court discipline, as I alluded to before, is that immigration judges have virtually no power over the DHS trial attorneys. Immigration judges are allowed to sanction attorneys for aliens. They are not allowed to sanction uh, the DHS trial attorneys. So imagine that if you were a litigation, litigating on one side. I know. like it, It's actually in the statute, but DHS has never agreed to allow D, DOJ to discipline their own employees. And it's, it's, we've tried to bring it up all the way to the White House, and it's never been resolved. Um, so technically, a DHS attorney, if they come in unprepared, all the IJ can do is really yell at them and then find them another day. So um, there are ways to complain. There's the um, Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, which is still pretty good. Uh, I've actually worked with them most recently. Um, Appleseed's working with that, that office on complaints about the travel ban uh, and the way that was implemented. So it's still a very active office, the DHS, Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Um, the head agency, the Office of um, uh, Policy and Legal Affairs, OPLA, within uh, DHS that oversees all the chief councils is a way to, to complain about DHS. Um, but for the most part, um, DHS misconduct is something that is very hard, uh, is very hard to get around. Um, but I will say again, like the judges over the last 20 years, I would say DHS misconduct has at least anecdotally, I think, become less frequent, um, although still you, you find uh, DHS uh, trial attorneys will be very, um, very aggressive. Um, so the last uh, thing is, um, if you need more information um, on this, uh, I'm happy to, by the way, send around this presentation. I think we have everybody's emails, and we'll send around links to the guide. Um, Malcolm is here, and, is, is, and he and I will stick around, happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and you can take cases from the National Immigrant Justice Center here in IJC, from the DePaul Asylum Clinic. Siobhan is here uh, from DePaul. Um, you should, anytime you take a case, talk with AILA or NIJC or any of the local folks about what is actually happening on the ground, who the DHS trial attorney is. The one unfortunate part about immigration court that we have reported on, as have others, um, is uh, that it really can often depend on which judge you get and which DHS trial attorney you get. Um, will have as much to do with, with the success of your case as your own preparation and your own client. Um, so it's good to know who your judge is, who your DHS counsel is on the other side, um, and try to, um, uh, try to get, uh, tailor your case as much as possible to the way uh, those two folks work. Um, so that's it. I, I uh, uh, hope you all do take cases in immigration court. I find it 
Um, you know, I know a lot of this focused on the obstacles and how it can be frustrating, but I think there is no greater reward um, than sitting next to somebody or standing next to somebody when a judge says asylum granted uh, or relief granted. And I can tell you almost 19 years after I first heard those words, it doesn't get old. It still sends a chill down my spine. Uh, to be able to look at a client and say, you're not going home and you're going to live here. So uh, thank you all for coming. And again, I'm happy to do anything uh, or help you any way I can. Thanks.